We're looking at the book of Acts. We've been studying it together. I do pray and hope that is a fruitful time for you personally, for your family, for your community groups, and, and for a church as a whole. We're closing in on that series. We'll be finished in three weeks, and uh, we will jump into our Advent season where we'll be uh, doing a Christmas series called The Canticles of Christmas, coming from the Latin word canticum, meaning song or, or hymn. Um, there's four of them in the Gospel according to Luke, chapters 1 and 2. There's the canticle, the hymn of Mary, uh, the, the canticle of Zechariah and the angels, uh, and the fourth one is Simeon at the end of chapter 2. And then Christmas Eve, we will meet here and gather together for a, a candlelight service where we will look at the canticle of Christ, Philippians chapter 2. Then coming January, what we will do is we will jump into a series called The Gospel According to Ezra, Nehemiah. That's where we'll be headed. It's an exciting time in the life of God's covenant people in, in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, we'll be looking at that book and looking to Jesus. Because in that book we see that by faith Ezra and Nehemiah were used to, to, to advance the kingdom of God. Inciting and preserving and adding to the hope. That this, this messianic hope of the coming king. Jesus Christ the Messiah. The book teaches us, teaches us a lot about like. The importance of the Word of God teaches us about prayer. It teaches us about worship. It teaches us, Nehemiah teaches us about, um, you know, um, leadership skills. And, and God promised to bring, if you know anything about the story, the Israelites back into Jerusalem, into the promised land. But most importantly, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, most importantly, is part of history, the part of the, the meta-narrative, the, the, the whole of, of, of who God is and what God is doing from Genesis to Revelation as he redeems, renews, and restores all things. It is redemptive historical narrative. So we're getting excited about that. So please, 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 please be praying as uh, we start looking at, you know, um, start reading and researching and preparing sermons for that come January. So that's where we are, okay? So children, you're dismissed. Wanted to let the kids know because they're really excited about where we're going in January, I know. And we're in chapter 24 of Acts. Bible's in the back if you don't have one. Um, so we're in Acts chapter 24. The series has been called Spirit Empowered Mission. Um, Paul had finished, if you remember, his third missionary journey and he finished at Jerusalem. When he got there, he had brought a monetary gift to the church there because of... of a serious famine that had taken place. He had collected money from Asia Minor and went to Jerusalem to deliver the funds that he had collected for this church. While he was there, he was approached uh, by the leaders there about some false rumors going on. They said, Paul, we hear that you're preaching the gospel to Jews and Gentiles. That's great. But we hear that you're telling Jews while you're preaching the gospel that they should not be involved or do anything that has to do with the custom of Moses. So James and the leader, the leader of Jerusalem and the other elders get together and they say, this is what we should do. Paul, why don't you go to the temple, pay for four men who've taken a Nazarite vow, go to the temple, pay for their expenses, pay to have yourself purified so that people will know that you're not opposed to the custom of Moses. So Paul decides that, all right, that's a good thing. It's okay to be a Jew. It's okay to practice the custom of the Jews as long as it does not infringe on the gospel. As long as it's not about salvation, you can be a good Jew, follow the customs of Moses, and still be a follower of Jesus Christ. So he does that. But while he's in the temple, Jews from Asia Minor stir up the crowd. They also made false allegations. They said, Paul, you're speaking against the Jewish people. You're speaking against the law of Moses. You're speaking against the temple. In fact, you, you dragged the Gentile into the temple area. So they grab Peter, they drag, excuse me, they grab Paul, they drag him outside the city, and they start beating him to a pulp. The Roman soldiers see what's going on, they rush in, they stop the beating. Paul waves to the Roman soldiers who now have arrested him. Can I speak? And Paul begins to share his testimony with the Jewish people. Does a great job. Gets to the end, mentions Gentiles, and the place goes crazy. Paul's like, listen, God does not simply and only love the Jewish people, He loves everyone. Even the Gentiles, they yell out, away with this man. He should not even be allowed to live. Have you ever noticed how religious people, I'm good cursed because, because I go to read my Bible, I go to church. They like to pick and choose who God loves and to whom should the gospel go to, right? They're like, you can't tell the Gentiles that. Yeah, that's where I'm going. That's what I'm doing. So 
Chapter 23, Paul gets swift away, uh, brought away by the tribune. He's a high-ranking official of the Roman court uh, system. And they bring him down in chains before the Sanhedrin. Okay? Paul meets the high priest. They exchange words. They do the tango. Crack. He gets the side crack across the mouth. Okay? Yeah. Like uh, jelly, you want a fresh one, if you know that story. But anyway, right across the mouth, he gets it. So they, get, they do the tango. They have their exchange. Uh, we know that Paul's nephew then intervened. If you remember the story from last week, there was a plot to kill Paul. The Jews were getting angry and more angry and more angry. And then Paul's nephew, his sister's brother, sister's son, hears about a plot. That's where we ended last week. And he goes to the Roman leaders First he goes to Paul, then he goes to the Roman leaders, and he tells them, listen, they're going to try to kill Paul. They're going to try to, if you bring him out in Jerusalem tomorrow, they're going to, they got a plot. They're not going to eat or drink until Paul is dead. The guy's like, all right, don't tell nobody. I'm trying to protect the little guy. He was, he, people argue about how old he was, but the Roman tribune took him by the hand, so I don't see he's 19 years old walking by the hand. But anyway, so there's a little lad, I think, walking by the hand. He's like, don't tell nobody. And, and, and then the, 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 Ro, the, the Roman tribune in Jerusalem says, you know what, let's get Paul out of here, man. This is going to be a mob scene. There's 40 men that want to kill him. At least let's get Paul out of here. Let's get him up to Caesarea where he can be tried by the governor up there. And let's get him out of here. And they take Paul at nighttime and they bring him to Caesarea. And that's where we pick up our story. Our story today in Acts chapter 24 is a courtroom drama. Some people like courtroom dramas. You watch all the cases, you watch the, I don't know, the OJ trials and maybe some of the other trials that were going on. Maybe you like Judge Judy. I don't know. There's all kinds of judges. I looked up and said, how many judges are there? There's like seven judge shows. So the courtroom drama seems to invite a sense of that drama. What are they going to say next? And, and then the prosecutor is against the, you know, the defense attorney. And it's like this chess game. You put the glove on. It doesn't fit. Like everybody glued to their TV. If you like that, you'll love Acts 24. You'll like, you'll like, you like Joe Brown. You'll like, listen, Acts 24. Easy movement. Acts 24 really broken into three scenes. Um, pretty simple. Scene one, the trial begins. Um, the powerhouse lawyer from Jerusalem comes up and they deliver the, the prosecution against Paul. They, they, they lay out the, the, uh, the charges against him. Second scene, Paul defends himself. Right? The defense of the accused. Paul gets a chance to respond to the accusation. And three, we see the decision of the judge, which really was an indecision. He didn't really make a decision, but sometimes, you know, when you don't make a decision, that's a decision. Right? And then at the end, we'll see how go the governor, who is in Caesarea, Felix and his wife, Drusilla, Drusilla, I tried to write that in my computer, it said Dracula, I'm like, no, <laughs> Drusilla, you know, that, you know, checking the words, you know, Drusilla gets a chance to hear the gospel. So that's where we're at, and let me just tell you this, as I read this chapter and prayed over this chapter and, and reread this chapter over and over again, uh, I want to remind everyone that although the missionary journeys of Paul have ended, Paul did not stop living on mission. Okay? He did not stop living on mission, declaring and demonstrating the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we will see today, Paul continues to look for and Paul continues to take opportunities to share the news, the, the declaration of truth about Jesus Christ. And that's so important. That I want you to catch that today. Living on mission is what we are all about here as, as individuals, as families, as, 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 as a church. Our mission statement, we exist to glorify God, bring Him praise and glory. By, by living on mission with Him, walking with Him, listening to the Spirit, walking with Him and telling others about Jesus, in making disciples, people who are committed followers of Jesus Christ through gospel-centered worship, transformation, and community. So if you consider yourself a disciple, a learner, someone who's following Jesus, and someone who is in the process of making other disciples by declaring the good news, saying, come and follow Jesus as I follow Jesus, there has to be, according to Scripture, there has to be disciples making disciples who live on mission. Otherwise, you're not a genuine, or not, I won't say a genuine, you're not really following the path of Jesus. For those who, who, who walk with Jesus, learning to love as Jesus loved, learning to being taught what Jesus taught, learning to serve as he served. You must live as he lived, and he lived on mission. He says, the Father sent me into the world to, to rescue people. I send them into the world to declare that rescue through the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So while you are going, that's the participle there. While you are going, wherever you are, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. I'm with you even to the end of the age. I will tell you the Apostle Paul took Matthew 28 very seriously. Because whether he was in a foreign land, in Asia Minor, in Europe, and we went through all the missionary journeys, he declaring the good news, demonstrating the good news, loving people, pointing them to Jesus. He did that throughout his missionary journeys in foreign lands. But now he's under Roman arrest. He's under the authorities in chains. And guess what he's still doing? Same thing. Same thing. That passion did not change where you are, what you're doing. Free to roam, locked up in a Roman cohort. It doesn't change. So let's, let's see that unfold here with, you, with, uh, with me here. Number one, the delivery of the prosecution. 24-1 is where we start. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus, and they laid before the governor their case against Paul. So five days had passed. If you remember from last week, they had given an invitation uh, the, 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 the Roman Tribune, uh, Cilia, uh, had, had sent the letter, if you remember. And then Felix, who's the governor, who's a higher-ranking official, said, you know what, Paul, we're going to hold on to you until your accusers come. Five days later, they show up. And I'm sure during those five days, the Sanhedrin, which is the legal body of the of religious people, the high-ranking body of the religious people who are bringing these charges, did a lot of work. I'm sure those five days are all around the table. All right, what do we got? What do we say? You say this. You know, I'm sure they were working on their case against Paul. They show up in Caesarea, but it says they came with a lawyer whose name was Tertullus. It says spokesman. That's the Greek word rhetoros, which means where we get our word rhetoric or rhetorician. So he's the legal advocate. So think for a moment with me. Here comes to Caesarea, from Jerusalem, this high-powered lawyer, $5,000 you know, $5, suit, $400 pair of shoes, surrounded by this crowd of Jewish people. You go get them, Tortillas. You go get them, man. We're, we're, we're right behind you. And in comes in with his briefcases. You can, you, can, you can imagine the scene, cheering and hoping they're going to go get Paul. Courtroom opens, all rise. The judge, Honorable Felix, takes the stand. Uh, excuse me, takes the bench. He summons Tertullus, verse 2, and begins to accuse him. And this is his opening statement in the courtroom. Since, Felix, Honorable Felix, through you, judge, we enjoyed much peace. And since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. In every way and in everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to tame you no further, I beg you, I beg you, in your kindness, to hear us briefly. Now, I understand you have to get the judge on your side, at least, like, communicate. <laughs> but does anybody see, like, overkill there? Oh, my word. We know we call those people. I won't get in trouble and say it. But, you know, it's like, really? Now, either he was like, or he was like, save all that, man. Just, just say your case. We don't know. But boy, was he laying on thick, right? Flattery like you've never seen before. He says, for we, verse 5, found this man a plague. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world. And, number two, he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. So notice the three charges. One, he's a plague. Now, I've been called a lot of things. I've never been called a plague, yet. Day still early. New American Standard Pest. New, uh, the King James says pestilence. If you have an NIV, it loses the strength of the Greek word, and they say troublemaker. Not really, not really so, more strong than that. In Luke chapter 21, a similar word, Jesus is talking about the end times. He says, nation will rise against nations, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, various places, famines, and pestilences. That same word. Terror and great signs from heaven. When Scripture speaks of a pestilence, it says, it does so in such a way that it, that it means like this contagious epidemic, this contagious disease, this devastating proportion coming upon the land. It's always mentioned in the Bible that God sends it and it's a judgment, right? And this is used of Paul metaphorically. 
right? So you're an infectious disease that has, you know, destroyed and, and ruined and, and, and causing all kinds of problems, devastating proportions. You are a problem. You affect people. You infect people throughout the world. Wherever you go, Paul, you're a public menace. In fact, it says here, look at verse 5 again, all over the world. I mean, everywhere, all over the world. A little exaggeration. That, that's actually litigation tactic, you know. You put that out there. It's not really true. It's not all over the world. It's, it's hyperbole. It's, it's just, put, you know, put that in the judges everywhere he goes around the entire, this little guy is causing millions of people. That, that's what Paul is doing. So you can imagine this high-powered lawyer, right? He's, he, he's trying to make an impression. I'll put that out there. And he says, you know what? If, if you set Paul free, he's a, he's a, he's a disorder. He, in fact, your honor, he'll even cause a rebellion in the empire. That, that's really what he's pointing to. You see, Rome and the Roman authorities, we're not really interested in your theology, your laws according to your religious beliefs. What they wanted to know was there going to be an insurrection. What they wanted to know was there going to be a group of people that were going to try to take down the city, the Roman empire. They were more concerned about that than anything else. Right, so this man is going to stir up trouble. Look at number two. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Strong overtones, right? Now, who came from Nazareth? Jesus, right? And the Jews for a little while were calling them the, 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 the sect, the, the Nazarenes. They were following Jesus of Nazareth. And you notice they don't want to mention the name Jesus. They're just like, you're in the Nazareth sect. And Nazareth was not known, I will tell you, in, in first century as this high-powered New York City, Boston city. It was a dumpy town, and what good could actually come of Nazareth? They're like, you know, you're from Palinville or something, but and if you're from Palinville, I don't mean nothing by it, but you know what I mean, okay? We love you too. Anyway, so he, he's, he's not part of Orthodox Judaism, and look what he says. He's not only a member of this cult, but he's the ringleader, right? Overtone. You're a sect, heresy, you're a ringleader. Like, you got this circus going on, and you're just bringing everybody in. You're a crazy person who, who's a pest, who's causing problems, you're of a sect, you're a ringleader. Look at number three, which is not true either. You tried to desecrate the temple. He desecrated the temple. Now, that was an important charge. It's not true. Remember, Paul had, they said Paul brought Trophimus, if you remember the story, into the temple and desecrated it because he was a Gentile. Nobody has proof. Paul would never do that, and nowhere in Scripture says he does. It was false. It was a false charge, but the Jewish people had agreement with the Roman authorities that what happened inside their temple, they had authority over. So if they could prove that, Felix would have no choice but to say, okay, take him, he's yours. Do as you wish, he's under your jurisdiction. That was an important charge. Because then they would say, okay, give him to us. Right now he's being guarded. So number one, you, listen, you're a pest. We got enough problems around here, we don't need you. Number two, you're a ringleader and you're getting all these people to, to, to follow somebody from this dumpy town. Number three, you desecrated a temple. Okay, that, that was the charge. Look at verse seven. If you have a Bible, you're wondering, where is verse seven? There is none. Maybe down in the bottom of your page. It's pretty cool, it goes from six to eight. You left it at home, go back and get it. No, um, verse seven has been deemed over the past... Uh, while now, uh, as not part of the original manuscript, the original parchment is what's called the autograph, the original autograph. So it, it put it at the bottom of your, usually your Bible saying that some manuscripts say this, but it's been deemed as not being part of the original uh, autograph, so they take it out. But look at verse 8. By examining him yourself, look at this weak argument he says. So here's the three things that we say Paul is. He's a pest, he's a ringleader, he's a, a, a temple de desecrator. And verse 8, this is the ending argument. All is settled, and he makes his final plea. By examining him yourself, Felix, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. Notice he doesn't say, my case is ended, lock, stock, and barrel, sealed tight, he's guilty. I mean, you know, what else can we say, Your Honor? We, we, we just about proved our case without a shadow of a doubt. He doesn't do that. He ends his case by saying, you know what, if you give enough Rope to Paul, ask him enough questions. You're a smart guy. Ask, he'll, he's going to hang himself because we really didn't do such a great job. There is no proof. Verse 9, Jews joined in. Yeah, yeah, go get him. 
affirming the charges. Felix somehow, I don't know, nodded to Paul, maybe gave him an affirmation, but according to strict you know, legal procedures, it was now Paul's turn. Look at the defense. Now, Paul is his own attorney here. Paul is going to give the defense of the accused. Now, Paul, remember, was trained in the law of Moses. He was a Pharisee. I am confident to say that during his training, or while he was being trained, it was very useful and helpful, amen, to this case. Now he's defending himself, but he's a well-versed man. He is used to defending. He is used to the, 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 this defending of the law. He was, he was well-versed in Scripture. So his training while he was under the feet of the famous Jewish rabbi Gamaliel, training in, in rigorous academia about pharisaical instruction was extremely helpful. But I don't think Paul, while he was a young man, learning all this, was thinking to himself, someday I'm going to be in front of the governor of Caesarea, in Caesarea of Judea, actually, in Caesarea, in chains, defending myself against Jesus Christ who's risen from the grave. I don't think Paul was thinking that when he was a small boy, amen, right? But what you see here, I think, I just want to point it out, is that Paul's training, Paul's experiencing, what Paul experienced, brought him to the place of defending himself well. And I point that out to say, you know, I don't know what God's doing in the moment in your life, and I'm sure it's for the moment, but it's also for the future. So when we're dealing with trials, we're dealing with difficulties, we're being trained and pressed and pushed, it is for the moment, but it's also for the future. You don't know what God's going to do five years from now, ten years from now. I've been through that. I've done that. And now God wants you to speak. So you never know. So when you go through trials, remember that, okay? Remember that when you face trials and hardship. So Paul steps up to the judge, verse 10. It's his turn. All eyes are on Paul. He's his own attorney. And when the governor nodded to him, he said, speak. And Paul said, all right. Knowing for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Notice the contrast. Right? Tertullus Tertil was so different. And there's no fawning, no flattery, no stretching of, the, stretching of the truth. Only a reference that, Felix, you've been here a while. It's been five years probably. That's what, the, that's what historians say. It's been about five years. You've been judge over the nations, and you know what? You have enough experience. You, 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 you know truth from falsehood. You know when there should be a case or shouldn't be a case. So I'm glad you got some experience. So now I'm going to give my defense. Right? That's what Paul is saying. Just, just here, here we go. What Paul does is he, he rips apart the three, different, um, the three different charges one by one. Number one, they say he's a pest. He's a troublemaker, stirring up trouble. Look at verse 11. You can verify, Your Honor, that it's not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, verse 12, and they did not find me disturbing, dis disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogue or in the city. In other words, yeah, I, w I was there. I was there. I was at the temple. Yep, I was worshiping there, but I wasn't causing trouble. Remember, he was out purifying himself. He was with, he was with the other guys doing the, doing the vows, the, the Nazarite vows. They were offering sacrifices. I, I was minding my business. In fact, if you're looking for the ones who were stirring up trouble, Your Honor, I'm not going to give you their names. I'm just going to point, you know, and he just points over at them. They're the ones. They're the ones that are doing it. The rioting and the disturbance really had to do with their attackers, not Paul. Paul had no history of really inciting the Jews. He said, I've been there 12 days. Could either, could either mean one of two things. I was in Jerusalem 12 days before this, this whole thing started. That's what some people think. What some people think, which I do, it was been 12 days since he got to Jerusalem, offered up the sacrifice. 12 days later, now he's standing before Felix. But either way, what Paul is saying, look, it's, it's been maybe, maybe, I, maybe I was free because he was in jail for a while too. Maybe I was free five or six days. Are you telling me I had five or six days? I caused that much trouble, Your Honor, really? Six days? I, I, you know, seven maybe tops. It's only been 12 days. And, and what's so cool about this is that what Paul is doing is he's using, like a, like, a, like a good lawyer, he's using the words of the prosecutor against the prosecution. Remember, Tertullus said that by examining Paul, Felix can verify the, 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 the charges. Paul's response is the opposite, really, is the case. Felix would verify that Paul was worshiping, minding his own business. Not inciting a riot. He, he's not saying I wasn't there. He's saying I, I was there, but I'm not the problem. Verse 13, neither can they prove to you that 
what they now bring against me. And he's continually pointing to their, their accusations as being unsubstantiated and very easy to refute. So you know what, Your Honor? I was there, minding my business, worshiping in a custom of Moses, minding my business. It wasn't me. They have no proof. Number two, they say he's a ringleader of the heretic set called the Nazareth. He said, no, actually, you know what? Verse 14, I'm a faithful Jew. His relation to the way is not a violation of his orthodoxy. That's what he says. Paul skillfully, very skillfully, faces the judge as the accused, and, and he says, you know what, Your Honor? I'll tell you this is true. I'll make this confession. Look at verse 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything they laid down by the law and written in the prophets. Now, I can, I, I'm, I'm following the way. Do you remember in chapter 9? It was Paul the apostle, actually it was Saul the Pharisee, who received letters from Jerusalem to go to Damascus to, to, to find, to beat, to, to, to bind and to abuse followers of the way. That's what the letter said. The phrase, the way, is Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now the followers of Jesus were following the way of Jesus, whom Paul, before he saw the risen Christ, was diametrically opposed to. Now he's saying, I worship the God of, us, of our fathers, an Orthodox Jews, as a follower of the way. See what he's saying? Paul is saying that my accusers are saying that if I want to be a faithful Jew, I need to renounce my allegiance to the way. Paul's saying, no, I worship the same one true God of the universe who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to all of Israel. The God Paul is worshiping is not different. It's not different than the God whom Moses worshiped. Look what it says. I believe everything that agrees with the law and the prophets. All that Moses wrote, all of scripture, all that the prophets have said. Paul's saying is, I, I worship that God, but I worship him now in the only acceptable way, and that's through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said. John 5, so that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Paul says, my, my faith is still founded in the Old Testament scriptures, but they bear witness to Jesus. The light bulb went on, and I see all the Old Testament prophecies and scripture pointing to Jesus. Luke, who wrote Acts, remember, wrote the first volume, which was the gospel, according to Luke. And at the end of the gospel, according to Luke, chapter 24, Luke records for us that Jesus, while walking on the road to Emmaus, came up to these men and said, you foolish ones, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then it says that Jesus began with Moses, the five books, and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Paul's like, look, I'm an Orthodox Jew. This new movement actually is rooted in old promises. That's what he's saying. The unfolding plan of God, the unfolding work of God, finds its center, finds its fulfillment, finds its focal point in this Jesus of Nazareth. So Paul says, I'm not involved in a cult. I'm not involved in a sect. I confess. I confess to my orthodoxy, worshiping the God of the fathers as I follow the way. His name is Jesus Christ. Even hope. Look what he says in verse 15. Having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. They believed, listen, their Jews, many of the Jews believed in the promise of the resurrection. They believed and had hope in the promise of the resurrection. And when Paul said that, if you remember in the courtroom, there were the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. They only had the five books of Moses. They did not teach it. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. And the Pharisees, he's lining them with the Pharisees who believed in the resurrection, at least in the end of the age, where there will be one resurrection to eternal life and to eternal damnation. And he's saying, listen, I, I, I believe just like they do. I just believe when the light bulb goes on, I see everything pointing to Jesus. It's about Jesus. My faith and my hope is in Jesus and in the resurrection. And then he puts, what does he do? He takes the Pharisees and he puts them again in the crosshairs. 
If I'm a sect and, I, and this is about the resurrection, which we're going to get back to, then you know what? What do you guys believe? We're kind of we're, we're talking the same language here. See what Paul is doing? He's defending himself, but he's being very smart. He says, look, verse 16, I have a clear conscience. Look, I have a clear conscience. Listen, I'm a faithful Jew. I believe in the resurrection. I'm not an inventor of some new religion. I worship the same God. I believe in the same standards of truth, but the same way of salvation is through the Son, Jesus Christ. My conscience is clear. And, and you got to wonder, when the gospel goes out, and he says, my conscience is clear, you got to wonder if he's thinking, I wonder how yours is. Is your conscience clear? There had to be people, can we get a couple of windows open? It would be great. I don't know if you guys are sweating, but I am. Um, there had to be people in that room, there had to be people in that room that's thinking to themselves, I don't agree with this man, I don't trust this man, I don't believe what he believes, but he didn't really do these things. You ever have a conscious, your conscience talking to you, can't get rid of it? And when people speak, when God's word is proclaimed, as you meet in community, as you gather together in corporate worship, God's word has is, 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 is just been drawing you and drawing you and drawing you. Now, they never turned. My prayer is that we do, that we confess, and as Ricky said, repent of our sins and, and, and claim the blood of Jesus, come under the blood of Jesus, be forgiven by Jesus. You got to wonder, you know, could it be? So the third charge, look at the third charge, desecrating the temple, verse 17. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms. He's telling him, listen, after seven years, I've been around a while. I brought alms for my nation and presented offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified the temple without any crowd. Like I'm, I'm hanging out with two other guys. Well, I don't know what crowd they're talking about. Some Jews from Asia, though, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what's wrong and what they found wrong as I stand before this council. So he said, I brought alms, I brought gifts, I, brought, I gathered money from other churches, I brought them to Jerusalem. Yeah, I was offering, in fact, I came and purified myself, I took four men with the Nazarite vow, that's all true. That's true, yeah, I was there, I went to Jerusalem, I did those things. But where are those Asian Jews who started the whole problem, Your Honor? I don't see them. They're not here. Your Honor, should, they should be here. They should bring charges against me. In fact, Roman law, you were supposed to face your accusers. That's proper procedure, legal procedure. Instead, they're nowhere to be found. Where's the evidence? I don't see them here. For if Tertullus who make an accusation against Paul with total absence of any witnesses is a serious, serious breach of procedure. Paul waits, <laughs> waits and says, okay, where are the accusers? Oh, they're not here. They're the ones that started the whole thing, and they're nowhere to be found. Verse 22. We'll come back to 21 in a moment. Look at this, the decision, point three. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off. While Lysias, the tribune, comes down, when Lysias, the comes down, that's, that's the guy in charge in Jerusalem, when he comes down here, now Jerusalem, remember, Jerusalem is here, Caesarea is up here, but when he says come down, it's because Jerusalem was up on the hill. So when, it, when, 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 when that uh, a, a leader, a tribune, comes down to Caesarea, I'll decide your case, verse 23. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, that's Paul, and have some liberty. And none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. Verse 24. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, not Dracula, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about what? Faith in Jesus Christ. Our text says, listen, I, I heard both sides. I don't want to deal with this. I, I, I'm really not sure yet. I do have an accurate knowledge of the way, maybe because his wife was Jewish. We don't know. But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you off for now. Let's wait to this. Some eyewitnesses, and, and then we'll, we'll deal with this. And then in the good providence of God, he says, you know what? Put Paul in custody. Watch him, but give him some liberties. Let his friends come and, and, and take care of his needs. Remember, this is, this is first century. He's going, he's going to be with Roman. He's going to be under house arrest or maybe in a jail. I don't know. But, you know, there's no TV and, 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 and mess halls. You know, all that stuff doesn't exist. If you didn't have family coming to take care of you and feeding your stuff, you would just rot and die. So you needed someone to come. I was in Cotui a few years back. We did a short-term mission trip. And I went to a, a psychiatric hospital in Cotui to visit somebody who had just tried to commit suicide. And um, they'll give you medication and give you some psychiatric help. But 
If your family did not come in and wash, bathe you, give you clothing, uh, sheets and pillows, you're on your own. Pretty rough. So Paul's like, thank you, Lord. You know, thank, thank you for provision. And then the Christians gathered together, I'm sure, and began to help Paul. But it wasn't long. Look at, it, look at the text. It wasn't long for Felix and his wife to send for Paul to hear about Jesus. She was Jewish. Maybe she had some questions. You know, we don't really know. But I'm going to tell you something about this family. Some of you think, well, why does, why does Pastor Lou do, do, do study? Why does, he, why does he read? And all I do is read, so anybody can do this, okay? All I do is read. I read Josephus. You read historians to give you a flavor of what's going on back then. And it's very important as you interpret Scripture. And here's one reason why. Let me tell you something about uh, Felix and his lovely wife, Drusilla. Okay? First of all, his name was Antonius Felix. He was the governor or procreator, what they call in Judea, from 52 to 59 A.D., Turns out he wasn't a noble man. He wasn't from a noble class. He wasn't from a high society family. He actually was a slave. In fact, if it wasn't for his brother, his name is Pallas, who had influence over the emperor, he would still be a slave. But because he had influence, he asked the emperor to set him free. And he worked his way up to become this governor. And during his office, Felix's office, there was all kinds of uprisings. And what Felix would do is he was so heavy-handed, he was so ruthless, that he would quelch things with with a Ryan arm, with a Ryan uh, iron fist. And he would shut things down. And that caused a lot of turmoil between moderate Jews and this guy Felix. So there, there was problems. Felix had three wives. First one, we don't know her name. The second one was the granddaughter of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And then Drusilla, which is the third wife. Drusilla's an interesting lady. She's the youngest of three daughters of Herod Agrippa I. She's about 20 years old, maybe less. Her father murdered James the Apostle, imprisoned Peter. Her great-uncle, Herod Antipas, murdered John the Baptist. And her great-grandfather, Herod the King, killed all the children in Bethlehem. So a strong lineage there, for sure. As a young girl, 12 or 13, she was going to be married to uh, a prince, but the prince refused to become a Jew because she's a Jew, so they broke it off. Then her brother, Agrippa II, gave her to marry this king in a small little state in Syria. She wasn't happy there. Then Felix saw her. Everyone says the same thing. She was beautiful. She might have been like 16. And through this magician, convinced her to leave her husband, and come and be his third wife. Josephus, you can read, this is a historical account. So here we see Felix and Drusilla, and you got some background. Maybe they had this spiritual sensitivity. I don't know, maybe because she was a Jew. Maybe because she knows how she was living was wrong. I don't know. But she's like, you know what? Let's bring Paul out and talk about Jesus. Let's, let's hear about this Messiah whom my whole background and my family and my Jewish tradition keeps talking about. We're waiting for this guy. Maybe he's got something to say. But notice what Paul speaks to them about. Now, he speaks to them about Jesus, faith in Jesus. So that's, that, that's the umbrella. But he speaks about righteousness. Felix, we know you're a heavy-handed man who probably is not righteous at all. You're probably pretty unjust. But let me tell you, the only way you can be righteous and just before God is through faith in Jesus Christ. All that you do, all that you have done will never get you right before God. Righteousness in Christ, uh, righteousness is only when you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. He lived the perfect life. You didn't. He died the death. You should have died. And on him and his righteousness can you be righteous before God. And then he talks to them about self-control. See what he says? Righteousness, self-control. Well, that's interesting too. Both of them seem to live not very tight to the vest, not not, not having that much self-control. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he talked about what he said in Galatians 5, that that self-control is really about the dwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Then look what he does. He, He says there's a judgment to come. There's a judgment to come. No matter what you are, governor, there's a greater judge. There's a celestial court. In fact, Felix, you know, you judge these cases. You do a good job, I got to tell you. But do you know that there's an eternal judge? That judgments will come, that no matter what you do, no matter how you judge, you're going to be judged by your maker? So you're not righteous. You're living after your own passionate lust. And you're going to be judged someday by the eternal God. But what I want to point out, though, in all that, 
is that I think, I mean, just reading this, he, he's speaking the gospel to them, not he, to, 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 to stick a hot poker in their eye, but so that they come to faith in Jesus Christ. There's nothing in the text here. It says he was talking to them about faith in Jesus. And sometimes speaking the truth in love, no, I should say all the time, speaking the truth in love is necessary. It's not trust Jesus and all your problems will go away. It's not trust Jesus and everything that's broken will be fixed. It's trust Jesus because you're a wicked sinner. You need to turn from your sin and trust in Christ and Christ alone. And, and you can see him living on mission. It's about mission. I'm in change. I'm going to talk about Jesus. Jesus loves you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. Listen, Felix, turn from your sins. No matter how many wives you had, no matter how many times you left whoever, trust in Jesus, repent of your sin, believe on Jesus. And you see the heart of Paul, he's more concerned about the gospel than he is about his chains. He's more concerned about sharing and demonstrating and declaring Jesus than he is about being released. You can't help but see that here in, the, in this passage. So no matter where you've gone, no matter what you've done, God's hand is not short that it cannot love you and rescue you. Paul is on mission. Unfortunately, Felix was alarmed. He said, go away. When I get an opportunity, I'll summon you. So he didn't really respond. Now, I want to close at verse 21. Can we go back to 21 to close? Please, verse 21. He said, listen, I... I, 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 I I follow the way that I confess that. It's orthodox Jewish beliefs. He has now revealed himself in his son. You must worship the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses through the son. I get that. But look at verse 21. He cries out, the one thing, if they want to have something against me, is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you this day. He said, I confess it is because of the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial here today. You know what's so odd about that statement? Nobody else brought it up. Tertullus didn't bring it up. The Asian Jews said he was discreet. Really, Paul? You're on trial because of the resurrection of the dead? The only one that's bringing that up is you. Your accusers didn't bring it up. They didn't bring it up in Jerusalem. They didn't bring it up in front of the council. They didn't bring it up here. You keep pointing back to that. Why? You're not on trial for the resurrection. Even verse 20, chapter 23, look what it says. Brothers, I am a Pharisee, son of the Pharisee, is respect to the hope of the resurrection that I'm on trial. Really? How could he say that? They squabbled over it, you know, with the Pharisees and Sadducees, but that wasn't the charge. So Tillis didn't bring it up. Why, Paul, do you keep coming back to that? Everything, everything is on that truth. Everything about this trial has to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen. Everyone knew that there would be a resurrection. Jews knew, most Jews knew that there would be a resurrection. Daniel 12, Matthew 25, even Jesus taught it. Of the just and the unjust. Do you remember when Jesus was on his way to raise Lazarus? He said to Martha, listen, you will see the glory of God. Believe in you will see the glory of God. Your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know he will on the last day. Even she shared that. There will be a resurrection. But what Paul is saying and what the church has been saying from the beginning of the resurrection of Jesus is something so much more than just a final resurrection. What they are saying is that the resurrection at the end of time is absolutely certain because of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, rose from the dead. Acts chapter 4. They were speaking. The priests and the captains of the temple of the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed. Why? They were teaching the people and proclaiming. Listen, they were proclaiming in Jesus in Jesus, in faith in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Do you see what they're saying? Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the dead. Just listen, let, let me break this down. Jesus Christ is not only raised from the dead, but it has its fulfillment and promise and everything about the last day of resurrection finds its fulfillment and promise in Jesus that's what he's saying. Now the followers of Jesus understood the empty tomb. That first Easter was the beginning of that single event where resurrection will come. Jesus is called the first fruit of the resurrection of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, Christ has been raised. He is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So listen. Everything about this trial is about Jesus. Because if he had risen from the dead, he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Redeemer. He is the Reconciler. He is the promise of all the Old Testament Scriptures if Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. 
Acts 2.24, God raised him up. It was impossible to hold him in the grave. Acts 3.14, he's the holy one and the righteous one because he rose from the dead. Acts 4.10, God raised him from the dead. There is healing in his name. Acts 4.12, he is raised from the dead and there is no other name in which a man might be saved. Acts 13, there is good news and the fulfillment is because Jesus rose from the dead. Acts 17, Jesus whom I proclaim to you because of his resurrection from the dead is the Christ. Is it important? Yes. Everything. Jesus now is the fulfillment of everything they were looking for. Everything they were hoping for. He is the anointed king of Psalm 2. He is the one who will not see corruption in Psalm 16. He is the exalted Lord at the right hand of the Father in Psalm uh, 110. He is the one Daniel spoke about in chapter 7 who has received dominion and glory and kingdoms and all peoples and nations will serve and worship him and have an everlasting kingdom. He's the one that all the prophets spoke about. This may be a new movement, Your Honor, but let me tell you, this new movement is based on very old promises, promises that were filled in Jesus Christ. Paul was not disturbing peace. Paul was preaching peace. Paul was definitely not leading people astray, but Paul was preaching about the way. The way, the truth, and the life. The way to forgiveness, the way to salvation, the way to God. Paul's message was that he was the follower of Christ and a follower of those who waited on the same promise back to Abraham. The reason he is standing trial has everything to do with the resurrection. Because if Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he has, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is the Christ. He is the risen King. If Jesus raised from the dead, and he has, that changes everything for you and I. Everything for you and I. One thing, one response. Felix, Jews, King's Chapel. If Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and he has, and he's the fulfillment of all that prophecy and everything that God has promised, it's worship. It's bowing our knees and worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's repenting of our sins and turning to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of our sins. It is every day getting to the place of, you died for me, you rose for me, you loved me, you called me, you accepted me, you have forgiven me. Lord, I want to obey you because of all that you have done. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. Don't be like the religious leaders who reject him. Don't be like Drusilla and, and, and Felix saying, you know what, some other day we'll deal with it. We call the whole church to repentance. We call everyone to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what this table is about. The broken bread, his body that was broken for you, the blood that was shed, for there is no forgiveness without the, uh, uh, the shedding of blood, the Bible says. That's what this table is all about. So if you're a Christ follower, come. Maybe, maybe, maybe you look down on others as the religious people have done. Maybe there's something in your life you're conscious that you need to confess and repent of your sin and come and celebrate the Lord's forgiveness. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, and today's the day. So the way we do it here, if you're a Christ follower, not, not, not King's Chapel, just a Christ follower, you're welcome to come. Take the bread and the cup and in, take communion with us. If you're not a Christ follower, then we would ask you to just, just pray, just talk to Jesus. Maybe if you, today's the first day you confess him as Lord and Savior, then come on up. But the Bible makes it very clear, this is for the family of God. The bread and the cup. So the way we like to do it here is the band will play, music will confess our sins. Unless you're not breathing, you have sin to confess. But then we don't stay there because we celebrate too. We confess, we repent, and then we celebrate because God has forgiven us our sins in Jesus Christ. So when you're ready, you'll come up, you'll get the bread, you'll get the cup, and enjoy the celebration of forgiveness that Christ offers to all those who turn from their sin and trust him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for this narrative. Thank you that we see in Paul, empowered by your spirit, living on mission, wherever he is, whatever he's doing, so that others will see, love, treasure Jesus above all things. And Father, we pray as the music plays and we respond, bring to mind things we need to confess. Bring to mind things that we need to repent from, turn from, Lord, and then help us to celebrate with great joy and great gratitude of all that you have accomplished for us, Lord Jesus, on the cross of Calvary. And thank you that your resurrection from the dead 
vindicates and verifies everything you've said. You're the promised Messiah. You're the King of Kings. You're the Alpha and the Omega. You're the one who will return to establish your eternal kingdom. Everything has been seen, declared, and made absolutely certain because three days later, the tomb is empty. Father, help us to respond. Holy Spirit, empower us. Help us to see Christ. Help us to love him. Help us to repent. Help us to celebrate him. What else do we have? The fact that you have died and rose. In Jesus' name.